Hi, I'm Leah Thompson, and you're listening to Stargirl After Show. This is the Stargirl After Show with Sarah and Sean. Your post-show breakdown of DC Stargirl with Easter eggs, exclusive behind-the-scenes info, and cast and crew interviews. This is our destiny. I finally know who I really am. I'm Stargirl. This is... Is the Stargirl Star. After Show. Hey, Star Fan, welcome back to Stargirl After Show, sponsored as always by Stargirl.tv and DCTV.news, your best resources for news, media, and spoilers about Stargirl and other DC Comics properties. I'm Sean. And I'm Sarah. And wow, what a corker of an episode. So much so that I just used the word corker for the first <laughs> time. I think it fits. I mean, it was good. I was trying to think back. The sixth episode of each season has been pretty big in the things that happen. I mean, season two, Eclipso gets his body. Season one, the JSA finally comes together for the first time. Yeah. First big fight scene there of the new JSA. Obviously, we started the whole show with a big fight scene. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, yeah, like you said, the, the big fight in the cafeteria. And now the Shiv and Cindy like smackdown that we've been waiting for since episode 104 this was very exciting i said shiv and cindy i meant you did i meant shiv and wildcat yep though we did get a shiv and cindy smackdown back in the finale of season two she was fighting the little girl version of herself oh yes okay yeah see i got it now all right i wasn't totally off the mark just (laughs) just almost entirely uh, this episode, 306, The Betrayal, uh, written by Alfredo Septian and Turi Meyer, and directed by our guest, Leah Thompson. I'm glad whenever I see Leah Thompson on there, because I know it's going to be a great episode, just like episode five was. And I'm super glad that we have Leah Thompson to talk to here on this podcast. Oh my God, what the hell? How did that happen? I know, that was amazing. Uh, Before we get to the Leah Thompson interview, let's go ahead and talk about this episode. Do it. Hit me. So I love the music playing here, the How You Like Me Now, as we have Cindy staring at the damaged ISA painting, going back to her little home base there. And do you think that she recognized the damage in the painting is from the staff? You know, I didn't even think about that. I think mostly what she's thinking is like, okay, well, this is compromised and I got to go. I was thinking that, and then I was wondering, like, is she suspecting Courtney of doing it? Or would she think of a star man? I mean, she is part of the team. She may know exactly what went down. Well, without Courtney there to pass stuff along to her, I don't know that the others are going to be real sherry with the information. It also doesn't seem very Courtney-ish. No, it doesn't at all. For all her faults, Cindy does legitimately know Courtney. It's true. Before that scene's over, we get her uh, Dragon King blink again. That was very exciting. And Mm -hmm. with a transition to the lizard eyes. Yeah, so I feel like we can't just keep calling it the Dragon King blink. We'll just call it a Dragon blink. Just be the Dragon blink. Okay. All right, then we go over to Rip City, and Rick is breaking in to test out the hourglass. So he uh, has his timer going. The bar is bending. There's so much weight on there, and it goes well past an hour. And he is good to go. And I think this is the perfect opportunity to let people know about our brand new merch shop. Yes. We were just doing stuff through Tee Public, but I wasn't real happy with the quality. So I stepped up the quality. I redid all our merch and I've introduced new merch, including not only a Ripped City t-shirt that you can buy in several colors, but also an embroidered Ripped City Quarter Zip Pullover. It's pretty awesome. Embroidered, guys. Okay? We have embroidered goods Mm -hmm. now. And I'm very excited about it. You can go to StargirlAfterShow.com and just click on Store up in the top right corner. And it'll take you right there. Or you can uh, go to StargirlAfterShow.com slash shop. Uh, Yeah, definitely go check it out. Because those are a few of the things that Sean created for it. But there are lots more awesome things on there oh yeah like you know if you should happen to want say a world's greatest mom mug as used by barbara or a world's greatest dad mug 
as used by Pat. Um, fun fact, the manufacturer is the same manufacturer as the one who made them for the show. Oh, really? So they're essentially the very closest you could ever possibly get to owning one from the show. Very cool. I didn't know that. Yeah, literally indistinguishable. And so much more stuff and more to come. Oh, my God. I can't wait until I have a little bit of spare time to to work on my big plans for this shop. But keep checking it because it's going to be so good. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's our shameless plug. And um, I do have actual commentary on the scene. Okay. Because Rick could have easily tested the limits of the hourglass anywhere. Mm -hmm. He could lift up giant boulders, trees, what have you. Yeah. It seems almost like he's being reckless, maybe uh, hoping that the very formidable owners of that particular establishment might catch him in the act. And as far as we know, they don't catch him, but someone is watching on one of those monitors as we zoom out and we see him there. And this person with black gloves on is putting together a puzzle. Yes. The Watcher does a puzzle, part one. Which it's very hard to do a puzzle with gloves on. So kudos to that person for being able to do that. I would love it if instead of doing a puzzle throughout the episode, it just cut back to them doing other like by yourself activities. Mm-hmm. Like just like puzzle, playing solitaire. Doing solitaire, maybe figuring out a Rubik's Cube. Mm-hmm. That would have been great. But it would have undercut the, uh, the sinisterness. It's true. And maybe revealed that the person secretly watching them is Ambush Bug. That could be. God, how much do I want an Ambush Bug cameo on a TV show now? (laughs) Let's make this happen. I love that our listeners now are just like expecting me to come up with with these bonkers red herrings. Mm -hmm. They've started to comment on it. Yeah. Um, I feel like Ambush Bug would be pretty far stretch. But you know what? I'd be into it. I'm going to text Jeff right now and see if we can do some reshoots. All right. And then we go over to Yolanda in the confessional. She's telling the priest about what she did. And he's telling her there's no justification for stealing. And she's like, well, I had to expose a liar. She was manipulating my best friend. And I thought that line was really interesting because it's not she killed a man. It's, hey, she's manipulating my friend. You know, Yolanda is still kind of in a gray area here. Also, it's it's a really good point where it highlights the love she has for Courtney and how much she values Courtney. Whereas, mm-hmm. as you said, manipulating Courtney is worse than murder. Yeah. Which makes the heartbreak at the end of the episode that much more palpable. Yeah. And that much more heartbreaking. Well, in this whole scene, it's, I mean, she, it seems like she's just going through the motions of trying to be a good Catholic and go to confessional and confess something, but she's just seeking forgiveness. She's not actually trying to be a good Catholic and like a good person who isn't going to go steal from people and fight them and all that. Isn't that the great Catholic loophole? And do whatever I want, say three Hail Marys, and I'm off the hook? Well, I mean, that is how some people treat it. That is exactly my understanding of it from movies and TV shows. But it just seems very different from last season, how much she was struggling with having killed Brainwave and like all the inner turmoil. It seems like she's very much moved past that now. I mean, thank God. We had a whole season of that. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad. But I feel like there's going to be a turn in her character now. But I don't want to overlook the most important line of this entire scene and perhaps episode and that is father thomas saying not to follow her own family in terms of and how you judge people yeah i'm in a little harsh there towards her family but good for you throw in some real but de- but deserved shade yeah because expletive those montezes am i right Mm hmm. All right. And then she wraps it up saying she's not asking forgiveness for what she's done, but what she's about to do. 
yeah. you know, really setting up the tension for the episode. And then we cut over to Mike juicing. I.e. making juice. Mm-hmm. Let's be clear that Mike is not shooting steroids. Yes. Yes, that's true. Um, because the Crocs have come over. They were just in the house this morning and stole all the cereal, the donuts. Apparently they took Pat's beer. And it was light beer. Like, come on. How healthy does a guy have to be? Yeah. I mean, stand up for yourself, Pat. And Barb's talking about like, what a great influence that they're being on them. And he's like, we're supposed to be the good influence on them. They are bad people. And other than their, than Crocs Jim and this mention of them, that's, that's all the Crocs we get, right? They're not in this episode. No, I don't think so. Yeah. I don't remember them at all. Mm -mm. We got Sylvester coming in and he's saying that, you know, there's no sign of Dragon King. He's at a loss. Like, what could be going on? Says he's going to update Courtney, but Courtney is already gone. And uh, from what Yolanda was saying, she's probably hanging out with high school's kid. And cue the Camney. Yeah. Courtney's giving one of her pep talks and this is uh, the start of a little bit of heartbreaking stuff, I think, where... She's giving her normal pep talk and Cameron's like, how do, how do you know all this stuff? And she thinks of Sylvester and has a flash to him. And I'm just like, oh, but Pat taught you so much. Like, I understand Sylvester's role and he is teaching you, you know, star man, star girl connection there. But don't forget about Pat. Also, it's worth noting that she had to pretty explicitly lie to Cameron here. Yep. Um, said that it was her coach back in California, her gymnastics coach. Is this the first lie she's told to him? I feel like everything else she's kind of... Been cagey, but not lie Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, it might be. It might be the first time that she has had to outright lie to him. And the second time might be when he makes the ice sculpture of his father. <laughs> and she gives a very uneasy, it's beautiful. Yeah. Um, I also have to say... Cameron, better painter than a sculptor. I think so. But, you know, this is his first sculpture. His second sculpture. He made the ice in last episode. Okay. The the first giant person st- a sculpture, I guess. Yeah. You know, I think it takes a little bit of practice. Well, I'll say that they probably didn't have to pay Neil Jackson any likeness rights because Cameron's not that great a sculptor. Probably. Okay, then we go... To Mike and Shaquem, and I am loving them this season. And this is great. They got the chocolates. And if Cindy doesn't like chocolates, they got flowers. And I love just a little detail that they don't have a giant bouquet of flowers. They have like four flowers that they possibly took from someone else's bouquet because they're just these freshmen in high school. They don't have all the money in the world to spend on flowers. Or someone's yard. Yeah, could be the yard too. Yeah, I I love the whole Cindy courtship Mm -hmm. deal. Um, And Jakeem's enthusiasm, man, is like the greatest thing. Yes. I would would have a Young All-Stars spinoff in a heartbeat. I would watch every episode of that. You could even give me 22 episodes. You know how I feel about 22 episode shows. I do. I do. I, I could watch them all day long, especially if... Cindy is a guest star all the time. Oh, yeah. Because they were so exuberant. And she just smiled and said, no. Yeah. So I think she's actually enjoying it. I think she is flattered that these, I mean, she's looking at them as like young, innocent kids are actually looking up to her and it makes her feel good. But also she's not going to team up with them. But, you know, the, the boys think that, um, She definitely didn't kill the gambler because killing him is beneath her. She's got more class than that. And it's kind of true. She does. Yeah. Though evidence not looking so great for her at the moment. No, but the boys don't know that. So they're fine to carry on with us. And then we go over to the pit stop and uh, Yolanda, Rick, Beth and Sylvester are there. And Yolanda shows them that she has a laptop. And then she got that from Cindy and Sylvester's like, okay, we cannot scare her away. We still don't know if anyone else is involved. So Beth is going to hack into it and then Yolanda will put it back. And it seems like they got the whole plan. Nothing to go wrong. 
Yeah, and it's it's weird, honestly, that at this point it's getting um, not strange at all to see JSA meetings without Courtney. Yeah, I kind of hate that, but yeah. Like it doesn't, it didn't even like stand out to me at first. Like, oh, this is the JSA, but Courtney's not there. And we don't have a count for days now. We just did recently. But it's still a bit within a week since a gambler was killed. Yeah, probably. But she uh, has other priorities now. And Pat and Barb are going over to Cameron's grandparents' house because of those priorities to um, just clear up the concern about the grandparents and... Pat's like, well, you know, shouldn't Courtney know better than that? And Barbara's saying, you know, love can cloud your judgment. Now, there's a really important thing about this uh, scene that I want to bring up. And I think it's something everyone should really know and focus on. And that is that Lutefisk is a dried and salted cod cured in lye. But it gets better because prior to eating, it is rehydrated for days, giving this fish a gelatinous texture. And this is what the McKents have served to Pat and Barbara. A gelatinous lye-cured cod. But it does not have poison. No, I did love that. She's like, why even serve it? (laughs) And she really doesn't do any work at all to hide the fact that she wishes these people were eating poison. No, she does not hide that at all. Um, For his part, Sophus does seem to be genuine in everything he's saying. Mm -hmm. He doesn't sound like he's putting on airs or trying to hide the truth it sounds like him and his wife are having genuine disagreements at this point yeah i think you're right i think he could possibly still be swayed by her but she is coming in hot just or cold good good call she's coming in cold here uh not holding anything back and being really harsh towards them but you know not saying it in english so they can't have any evidence for sure and of course courtney and cam come in and Courtney is mortified. Oh, yeah. How would, how would your teenager react if he walked into his uh, significant other's place to find you and your husband there? I think he would probably be embarrassed. But also, maybe this says more about us as parents. He probably wouldn't be surprised. I can see you planning it right now. Exactly. So evil. Not evil. Just making sure that, you know. His significant other's grandparents aren't going to try and murder him or us. I mean, that's always a concern with grandparents. It's true. I really like Barb's role in this. She is like really leading the conversation and everything because unlike all those super heroics, this is something she can do. She can be the parent for Courtney and she can get information by being a concerned parent. So I thought that she did a great job in the scene doing that. Except for the one moment where she's like, special how? Mm-hmm. Yeah, she did get caught that one time. Which, you know, it's either she wants to see what we know, or this woman is way too involved in her daughter and wants us to tell her great things about her daughter, mm-hmm. which is maybe worse. Yeah, probably. All right, and the scene gets interrupted by this great scene at the diner with Zeke. Mike and Jakeem, they're having girl issues so they go to the expert apparently which is zeke of course he is look at him apparently he uh is very knowledgeable about love he was dancing in the moonlight on beaches of monica with the duchess of Liechtenstein. hell yeah he was he had his heart broken going on but there are two universal truths in life you can't unstrip a screw and you can't give up on love but you're burying the lead here the lead is zeke Rhea. Oh, Zeke Rhea. All right. I like that. Oh, yeah. We're hashtagging Zeke Rhea this episode. This is my ship. 100%. Sorry, Camney and Our Night Shippers. It's all about Zeke Rhea now. This is the ship we all need. She is the only girl who has tamed his wild heart. I will tell you, um, Zeke had a lot more examples 
in the script of uh, his various escapades in love. Oh, yeah. And they're all fun. I could watch a Zeke spinoff also. Zeke mm-hmm. should be one of the main supporting characters in our Young All-Stars spinoff that we, uh, yeah. we are definitely going to write and pitch. Uh, yeah, he could be the tech guy. And then he could be the guy in the chair. Because sometimes a man just needs himself a robot. Exactly. Or in this case, sometimes a boy just needs himself a robot. And a best friend with a genie. Mm Mm-hmm. And a lizard girl. Oh my god, this show is amazing. This show that exists in my head is 100% amazing. Oh yeah. No, I say we call Jeff up right now. Hashtag on all-star spinoff. Let's do it. The boys go outside. Mike saying that that was such a waste of time. And Jakeem found it very interesting. Jakeem is wise. He is wise. Except for Mike is not a great influence on him. No. But I feel like Mike needs Jakeem in his life to balance him. Yes, I think so. God, that's why Young all Star spinoff works so good. <laughs> All right, then we go back over and uh, Courtney is just like, what are you doing here? Why didn't you call me? And Barbara's like, well, you are ignoring literally everyone. Yeah. You know, when your phone's on do not disturb or off or silent or whatever it is, you can't keep criticizing people for not calling you. Uh, Especially when you're a superhero and you could be doing very dangerous things. And sorry, Court, you're kind of reckless. So... If you aren't being heard from, they can assume the worst. Yeah, you know, Courtney, let's have a chat for a second. You know you're doing something wrong if I'm criticizing you. Because I'm team mm-hmm. court all the way. Yeah, that's true. If if I'm being critical of you, you've messed up. And then they decide it's time to go. And I love Pat's line about the the lutefisk being right up there with catfish, grouper, and tilapia. Because, I mean, I eat those fish, but they are not top of the line fish. So I don't know if he actually thought it was good and was comparing it to that level or if he was just naming fish that he has known and caught before. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I love catfish. And over the weekend, I had a beautiful grouper sandwich at a new place here in Atlanta called Fishmonger. Shout out to Fishmonger in Virginia Highlands. Go try it. But uh, I don't think that was scripted. I'm pretty sure that was a Luke Wilson ad lib. Okay. I would have to double check to be sure. But yeah, it doesn't sound familiar. I I think it was a Luke Wilson ad lib because here's a little bit of insight to the show that I may have mentioned before. Directors are encouraged to allow the cast, once they've gotten the scripted stuff, to do a little ad-libbing. Oh, okay. And I think that was intended mostly for Luke Wilson. And that was a, a guideline as back as as far back as season one. Oh, okay. So like, you know, once once you've got what you need, let these guys do their thing. Let them ad lib some. And there's not a ton of ad lib and they're not changing things. You know, that actually, like, alter the course of the story or anything. Yeah. But um, if you watch the dailies, especially with, like, Luke and uh, Joel McHale, you'll see uh, different takes will have different, just little changes to them. Okay. And, you know, that could be one of those things. I was wondering uh, his last line when they're leaving. When he says, I love old people, but they scare the hell out of me. I wasn't sure if that was scripted or if that was him because it came out so naturally that I thought it might have just been him saying it. But I I thought that was a great line, scripted or not. I think that it was scripted and Luke's just an amazing actor. It's true. He makes stuff feel naturalistic. But I got ahead of myself because before they leave, um, you know, Sophus is saying, as long as our children are both happy, that's all that matters. Isn't that right, dear? Nudge, nudge. Lily very begrudgingly says, of course. And then Camney holds hands. And then Court is all mad and getting super defensive. 
being like, you know, I don't know how many times I have to tell you he's, he's not his dad. And they're like, yeah, we know, but it's the grandparents. Clearly not take, looking at the full picture here, Courtney. And, you know, she does come clean about uh, Cindy having told her about Lily's ice powers. Mm -hmm. And I like that we know they both have the ice powers. But, you know, the show's being very careful to let us know, like, okay, Courtney doesn't know for sure. I don't know. It feels like the kind of slip up that shows could make very easily. Mm -hmm. Where she's like, oh, they do have the powers. Leaving us to all go, how does she know about Sophus? Well, I think it worked well here because she didn't want to fully admit. Because then that's showing that she isn't really thinking about the full picture about how the grandparents knew about the Icicle. She's like, well, maybe. I mean, it came from Cindy, so I don't know if it can be trusted. She didn't want to, you know, admit that she may have been not very safe. Well, I think that she also knows that she can trust Cindy on that. Oh, I think she knows that. But the way she's framing it. Yeah. This next scene, I'm just going to read what's in my notes. And that's all we need to say about it. The Watcher does a puzzle part two. Yep. And then we go over the bath and the laptop and more awkward scenes with her parents. So she's copying all the data off the laptop onto an external drive. And her parents come in and she has blocked them. Like, they cannot reach her now. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, I don't think we really need to get into it. It's just a rehash of the whole, like, it's for your own safety, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I do have one thought of when she's talking with Yolanda. And she asks if she would let her parents into this side of your life. And Yolanda says, hell no, but my parents suck. Yeah, that was great. Yes. I'm wondering, right now... This might just be my dream of what I want to happen, but I would like Beth to kind of go evil. Maybe she lets her parents back in. Something happens to her parents and she blames the JSA for that because she's already kind of starting to show signs that she's not going to blindly follow like she has in the past. She has her own thoughts. She has her own motivations. So I think that would be a cool storyline to go down. Interesting. Interesting. I, for my part, was noticing how much shade is being thrown at the Montezes in this episode. Mm -hmm. And I am here for it. I think just everybody should like go around in a circle and talk about why Yolanda's parents suck. Yeah, there's plenty to choose from. Like I would watch a whole episode of just everybody having an intervention on her parents, but like a mean one. Oh, they, yeah. Where they sit them down and they say, like, you suck. Your priest knows you suck. Your daughter knows you suck. The whole damn town knows that you suck. We're not here to try to, like, help you. We're not coming from a place of love. Y'all just suck. Mm -hmm. Whole episode of just that. All right. And then we go to uh, Courtney's room and Barbara brings her flowers that Cameron just dropped off. And I love the contrast of these flowers compared to Mike and Joachim's flowers. This is a big, beautiful bouquet. And uh, Barbara's just kind of hovering there while she's getting the card out. I did write Barb hovers. It's the only word for it. It really is. And she opens a card and it's, thank you for giving me hope. So sweet. Also, it's sort of reciprocal at this point. Because right now, Courtney's not in a great place. Mm-hmm helps her feel better. You know, she's sort of doubting this whole thing. What with having to admit out loud that the Makens have powers. Yeah. Though we neglected to point out that she did not mention that Cameron has powers. She's still keeping that from uh, Pat and Barbara. That's true. I didn't think about that at this point. Yeah. She, she admits that maybe the grandparents do, but doesn't mention Cameron still. So, you know, while she's dealing with all this and thank you for giving me hope, gives her a bit more hope and you can see her spirits lift a bit. Yeah, for sure. And then we get into the exciting scene of the episode here. Back at Cindy's house, Yolanda is returning the laptop, but Cindy is there. Yeah, she gets straight up busted, caught in the act, as it were. Mm -hmm. 
she Cindy is trying to explain herself and say, you know, I, I know how this looks, but I am telling you, I didn't do it. I can explain everything. And Yolanda is the one who throws the first punch. You know, Cindy is working to de-escalate the fight. And she actually continues throughout here for like a while. I mean, she's not trying to de-escalate, but she's holding back for sure. Yeah, it wasn't until Yolanda cut her hair that that's when she flipped and she started fighting back. Not even then. Like, yeah, she's fighting back, but she's still holding back. Oh, yeah. Um, but I was thinking the whole time, how can you beat Cindy? I mean, she's invincible. She's Wolverine. As far as we know. Yeah. You know, as they continue fighting, the fight goes through the window and out in front of the house, just like it did with Cindy and Courtney mm -hmm. in episode 108, Shiv Part 2. Yep. So then we see Beth finding the cameras that Gambler had previously found, and she sees the fight. And I just want to say, like, I love this thing. I don't know. Maybe she's always done it, and I've only started noticing her recently. But, like, she takes off her glasses to put on her goggles. And it's just adorable the way she, the way she like, takes off her glasses, put on her goggles. It I know, is. I noticed it last episode in the uh, math classroom when Sylvester called her. It's, like, the most un-Clark Kent way to take off your, uh, take off your glasses. Mm -hmm. But, you know, clearly she's calling in reinforcements. But before Courtney shows up, Rick joins the fray, throws a freaking van at Cindy, um, and then, like, jumps in almost flying-like. Uh-huh. Like, this dude is supercharged. Like, super-duper charged. Uh, yeah, removing the limiter and, I guess, whatever other tampering he was doing with it did a lot more than just extend the past an hour. Well, I wonder if the power is, like cumulative now oh it just keeps getting stronger and stronger as long as it's yeah rather than dialing him to 10 what if like the energy he doesn't use is building up oh that would be interesting yeah because i mean that would be terrifying we have not seen this kind of power before we've seen him pick up a car but there was mm -hmm. nothing to indicate you know judging by the way he almost crushed himself under it way back in 106 that he could like throw it you know, 30, 40 feet or however far that was, nor do that massive 30 foot in the air jump that he did. Yeah. But here's where we get to the part that I was talking about with Cindy. The damage from this fight reveals her, sh her shoulder, her arm, her lizard arm. Mm -hmm. And it isn't until Yolanda says, you're just like your dad, that Shiv literally and figuratively comes out. Yes. She's holding back until that moment, and then it's all snicked, or whatever we call the, the Shiv sound effect of snicked, because she's Wolverine. Yes. And then that, that's where she's like really unleashed. And the fact that she held out that long says so much about her progress in this season. Oh, yeah. I fully believe that she did not kill the gambler. And this has just been a continuous series of events that is making her look really bad. Yeah, I mean, this was Cindy in this fight right up until this moment. Yeah. And if Courtney hadn't shown up when she did, I fear that blood would have been irrevocably spilt. I wouldn't want to face Shiv in that mood, honestly. Oh, no. Because I don't think we'd ever seen her like that. She wanted to prove herself in season one, but we never saw her, like, enraged to the point of losing self-control. I mean, yeah, she was pretty in control when she killed her dad. Yeah. Courtney barely stood up to her back in 107 and 108. And I, I, I don't like Wildcat's chances in this fight if Courtney doesn't show up at this point. Luckily, she does show up and uses the shooting star move. Yeah, that was a beautiful shot. And uh, everything there where she is standing you know, in front of Rick and Yolanda against Cindy and then just trying to figure out what's going on and what's happening. You can see her putting together that the DNA was not Dragon King. It was actually her. Also, it's the first time we've seen her suited up in a while. Like it stood out to me like, oh, Oh, yeah, she uses the cosmic staff. I forgot. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, I thought Cindy showed real vulnerability here, explaining that she started changing, coming back from the Shadowlands, that she was trying to find the cure, trying to figure out what's happening to her. And then just breaks, you know, stop looking at me like I'm a monster. And then she does the dragon blink. And that was poor timing. And that was the first time that she noticed the dragon blink. She didn't know she was doing it Mm -hmm. prior to this moment. And then she's like, oh my God, what the hell? And then I think she's just super freaked out. And that's why she lashes out the way she does and spills the beans about Camney. Yeah. Who that was quite the flip, you know, revealing that he's, she's been teaching Cameron how to use his powers and Yolanda and Rick look pissed. I love that Rick, you know, Rick is given to outbursts, but his reaction is what? Like very subdued. Yeah. Which is kind of scarier. Yeah. If he had shouted like, what? It wouldn't have been as effective as what? Yeah, because it's that like your parents are disappointed. They're not mad. They're disappointed. It was more of that. Or like maybe so mad they can't like actually move their body. Mm -hmm. Over at the pit stop, Courtney is trying to be a leader saying, you know, you should have had had a plan, you know. And they were like, we had one. You just weren't involved in it. You aren't around. And even Beth turns on her. And that's that's a moment that must really hurt. Oh, they are giving her the business. And can I just say, like, damn it. When Breck cries on screen, it is a real gut punch. Oh, yeah. I have said on this podcast before, I do not like anyone that makes Courtney cry. And like the whole JSA just did. It was heartbreaking. It really was. It was very much the Yoko effect here. It was... Ooh. And she's fighting back her tears and saying, until we get this sorted out, maybe Sylvester should lead the JSA. And then Yolanda coming back with, he already has been. I'm like, oh, you do not need to twist a knife when it's already there. But also, like, true. Mm -hmm. So back at the house, Sylvester comes and has a heart to heart with Court. Yeah, he was giving a great pep talk there. Yeah. And, you know, all about his sister and Henry and how he never got to meet Henry, who was the only family he had left. And he's talking about Mary and how he thought for a while, maybe brainwave was controlling her mind, but he's like, no, I think she actually was in love with him and thought that she could change him. And he doesn't blame brainwave for his death. He blames icicle. I mean, yeah, obviously brainwave did the murdering. He, he deserves the blame, but He did it because he knew Icicle was going to make him choose. Yeah. But also, like, what a crappy choice, dude. Choose your wife. Is, like, you don't kill your wife for your your buddy? No, not, not really good marriage practice there. It's not like he had any cause to fear Jordan. Because, let's be honest, between the two of them... If it comes to blows, my money's on Brainwave every time. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Icicle has to get lucky to get a, an Icicle through his brain if he wants to win that fight. Mm-hmm. By lucky, I mean like real lucky, because if he gets anywhere near Brainwave, Brainwave can just shut his whole body down, melt his yeah. brain straight out of all his face orifices. Yeah. Oh, I'm glad he's gone. Yeah, he was very creepy. That's why we had to put him in a coma for six episodes. Mm -hmm. You just can't have someone that powerful roaming around. You got to catch him off guard if you want to kill him. Exactly. Yolanda knows what's up. She does. Uh, Sylvester wraps up this little talk with uh, some wise advice from Stripesy, which I thought was really cute. Uh, Don't try to do everything yourself. And we see Pat has been listening from the outside and he kind of looks unhappy. Uh, Then we cut over and Beth is investigating all these feeds, the video feeds, and she sees the Whitmore Dugan house. I think earlier she was caught off guard by seeing the fight in front of the uh, Mm -hmm. Berman house. 
she didn't have time to like really delve into what these were. And so now she's going back right. and like seeing like, oh, oh, this is actually really troubling. Mm-hmm. And then back over to the Whitmore Dugan house. Yeah, where Pat's saying you've been piled on enough and nothing can be said that's better than what Sylvester already did. And she's like, yeah, Sylvester's the best. And Pat seems a little bit resentful. But also, shut up, Pat, because... Pat had a huge talk with Sylvester about how Sylvester needed to be a positive role model for Courtney. It's true. And that's what he's doing. He's doing what was instructed of him or requested of him, however you want to look at it. And um, God, if that isn't character development for Sylvester. Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't think Sylvester's doing anything wrong. It's just Courtney is... She gets laser focused on things. And so she is just focusing on what Sylvester has done for her and not thinking about everything that Pat has done for her and all the reaching out that he's been trying to do too. But she's too preoccupied with Cameron to recognize that. Also, she's lying about Cameron to everybody. Yep. And then Beth comes in looking very frazzled and... The look on Courtney's face. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, she was so excited. Like, oh my God, my friend is here. And then you can kind of see her realize, oh, she's not here to talk about things or to forgive me. It's something's going on. Yeah, but like the look on her face when Beth came in where she's just like, oh my God, things might be okay between us. Oh, God, how many times, Breck, can you break my heart in one episode? With your face. I know. Your dumb face doing those feeling things. She was killing it in this episode. I feel like I say that about someone every episode this season. I mean, someone out there is obviously going to do a super cut of me saying like, oh, everybody's on the, on the show is just so great. But it's true. Maybe it'll be Cluster Edits, who was not credited when I mentioned uh, their super cut last episode when I talked to Hunter. So uh, if you guys like supercuts and and edits of Stargirl stuff, go follow Cluster Edits on Twitter. Yeah, for sure. Can I also take this opportunity? I don't know why I haven't mentioned this before, but at Dragon Con, I did get to meet a couple of our fans, which is weird to say. I got to meet Osama, who lives here in Atlanta and is a huge fan of Stargirl and the podcast great guy and i got to meet uh star and her parents and they were just next level awesome people star was entirely too excited to meet me i'm not worth it but i uh, i'm very happy to have made her happy and uh hi star hi osama nice to meet you guys it's been like so many weeks now but i i keep meaning to give them a shout out and i keep forgetting so here we are now i've remembered the star girl community is such like a great happy and supportive fandom i'm very happy to be a part of it it's just bananas and the people are so invested with these very very long twitter threads of potential storylines like ideas for what's coming next and legitimately like you guys have no idea I'm sorry, you have no idea. You cannot see what's coming. Oh, I'm so excited, though. But God, I can't wait for the rest of the season. It's so good. But yeah, the greatest fandom. It's a fandom that seems not to tolerate jerks. Mm-hmm. So many fandoms get so toxic, and I haven't seen any toxicity in this fandom. No, I haven't either. So anyway, back to the scene. Beth uses the old... Their listening in trick of making a loud noise to with the juicer Mm -hmm. to let Pat and Courtney in and uh, shows them that they're being watched right now. Yeah. And it's a good thing she made that noise so that they wouldn't hear her say anything, because when Pat and Courtney both saw it, they have both immediately looked up to where the camera would be. Yeah. Such dummies. Can I say, though, um, that juicer was introduced in like episode two. Yeah. And no one has said this to me, but I can assure you 
that juicer was only introduced for this scene. That would make sense. It serves no other purpose. And, yeah. you know, it's it's very nice to see, like, I feel like a lot of other shows would have had that scene with Croc bringing the juicer at the top of this episode. Oh, yeah. I think you're right. Yeah. So it's just more of that, like, great Stargirl writer's room planning things out. Yeah, playing the long game here. But speaking of, we zoom out of the screen and here's that person that's been watching since episode one, putting together the puzzle and kind of looks like maybe it's a skull. Oh, it's a skull. So I'm wondering if Mr. Bones is going to be showing up here. Well, gee, I don't know, Sarah. We should point out that the next episode is called Infinity Inc. Part one. So we'll see how that shakes out, huh? Mm hmm. And that's the episode. Of course, that's our coverage of the Stargirl episode. This podcast episode still has much more to go because Sarah and I are going to pop on over and talk to Leah Thompson, which is a thing that's going to happen right now and not last week. Absolutely. She is so wonderful and so passionate. And I am so happy that we got a chance to talk to her. Insert back to the future joke here. Uh, and we'll be right back after these breaks. Stargirl After Show. Stargirl After Show. Well, Sarah and I are so happy to be here with Leah Thompson, who has just directed her fifth episode of Stargirl. And while she's been doing a lot of TV directing lately, she's probably most well known for some of her acting, including her most famous role in the 80s classic Jaws 3D. <laughs> now, of course, she's from Back to the Future. Leah, thank you so much for being with us. And I can't tell you how excited I am to have you here. I love Stargirl. I'm really happy to be here. I've been there uh, working at Stargirl for three seasons. And to do two of them is such a joy because you really get to be involved in the story and involved in the, the actors lives and really, you know, get to really dig in. And I've, I've enjoyed every moment of my directing on star girl. Now I went back and I reminded myself of just which episodes you had done. And mm -hmm. you did some, like you did a whole bunch of firsts for the show. You did the first big confrontation between Cindy and Courtney in Shiv mm -hmm. part one. The that was great. The giant fight in the gym. Mm -hmm. But then when you came back for season two, you did the first Thunderbolt episode, mm -hmm. which had our first look at Johnny Thunder. It had a mm -hmm. nice JSA flashback. It had the first shade confrontation. It was the first appearance of Jakeem on screen. I mean, that was a really epic episode to direct. Yeah, directing Thunderbolt when when he was brand new and everything was really a challenge for me. I remember I had two a salt and a pepper shaker because they, you know, I had to kind of choreograph where he would go. So I would move these salt and pepper shape shakers around and I would I acted it all out for Trey so he would know and for the animators to to know what i was trying to do and uh it was such a it was such a challenge and it was uh when all the stop signs fell down it was a really really fun fun thing to direct and try to make it interactive i had like a uh i had things swooshing around and bikes setting up i just tried to imagine how thunderbolt would act and sadly, I didn't have the voice um, voice of it, bef you know, when I was shooting. So that would have been really helpful. Yeah, I understand Randy Havens was reading the, the lines for Trey. Yeah, he did a great job. <laughs> he did a great job. And that was something I kind of insisted on, like kind of having a real actor there to, to inspire us. Because I remember when um, Bob Zemeckis did Roger, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, he was talking to me about it and I was talking about why I think why I thought one of the reasons Howard the Duck was not as good as it could have been was because they had um, puppeteers that weren't really actors doing the lines. So all of the timing was kind of off. So I had told 
Bob Z, I was like, if you can get an actor, you have to have an actor on the set reading the lines. Otherwise, all the comedy is going to fall flat. So I brought that to to Stargirl and I think it worked really well. It absolutely did. Um, and you're bringing up so much stuff that I'm really excited to talk to you about. And I'm going to do my best to not keep you here for three hours with <laughs> all my my nerd love. Um, as a child of the 80s, I mean, you were there the whole time. <laughs> But um, we've had just about the whole cast on this podcast, many of them several times. Every time your name comes up, they all light up with such delight to talk about how wonderful a director you were to work with. Aww, that makes me so happy. Oh, it's 100% the case. I remember last season, Trey saying, talking about that episode, um, mm-hmm. but yeah. Yeah, especially had great things to say about you. Well, I really love working with a young cast like this, a young, talented cast. It makes me so happy to be if I can just give them a couple of little tips that I have learned along the way. It, it especially makes me happy to work with young women because I, you know, being an ingenue is a kind of a special thing. And I was an ingenue for too long for many years and so i kind of understand the pressure of having to be pretty and smart and you know all of the things that come along with that um breck is so so great she's such a great leader and she makes all it all work and all hold together and do you know she does such impossible impossible things you know all the time I, uh, I am so impressed with her as a person and, and as an artist. And it's been such it's just a joy working with her and watching her grow through the years in this part. Well, I think that a big part of why they respond so well to you is because, as you said, you're coming at it as someone with an acting background. Mm-hmm. So you have a, a more unique perspective on what they are going through and what they're experiencing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So with that in mind... I would like to rewind a little bit and talk about your acting career, particularly in the early days. And, you know, I joked about Jaws 3D, which (laughs) is quite enjoyable. (laughs) But looking through the work that you did in the 80s, it was really like a lot of stuff that even the things that didn't hit big at the time are such Mm -hmm. cult classics now. There's Mm -hmm. Red Dawn. Howard the Duck, as you mentioned, which is a movie that I super loved growing up. And of course, Some Kind of Wonderful, Mm. on which you met your husband. Is that right? Yes, I met my husband, Howard Deutsch. He was the director of Some Kind of Wonderful. And um, we've been married, what, 34 years, 33? Who knows? I'm not who's counting at this point. But um, yeah, it was... uh, Obviously, that movie is, is a John Hughes written movie. And it still really holds up. It's got a great soundtrack. Um, You know, there's a lot of movies from the eighties that are starting to get really embarrassing that, you know, they're, I don't know. I think we've all gotten a little bit more aware of, of our, you know, of being insulting (laughs) to different groups. And uh, so there's a lot of movies from the eighties that aren't, aren't aging that well, but I, I think some kind of wonderful really ages well, even the, the music, the costumes, even the hair weirdly is pretty good. So, and, but, but more importantly, the themes and the way people are talked about and treated um, are still pretty, pretty cool. And uh, I'm proud of that. And I, I think I think I think Back to the Future has aged pretty well too. I mean, obviously, when we went back in t- when we went forward in time to 2015, it looked nothing like that. But ah, <laughs> uh, the far future of seven years ago. Yes, exactly, with the flying cars um, and all that. But I, I think you know, outside of that, I think the movies hold up in terms of the themes being. St- still themes that people are really interested in like your parents were people too (laughs) and uh you know if if you if you if you stand up for if you have courage in a very important moment of your life to stand up for what you believe in and for what is right you can change your whole future 
And I think that's a theme that's that's really very powerful. I think that's a theme that people want to teach their children. And so I think, you know, so I'm proud of those movies. Red Dawn is an interesting movie. Um, you know, Russians invade America and uh, we are like a, just a bunch of kids in Colorado and have to fight it off. And we're just a couple I, of years away from that movie coming true now, too. I know. Could be. I mean, I know that I've seen pictures of the soldiers in Ukraine painting Wolverines on the tanks, on the Russian tanks. And that, that gives me like this very weird feeling, but happy to inspire <laughs> that amazing, those amazing people. But yes. So yeah, the movies that I've done, I, I'm, I've even Howard, the duck has got a huge fan base and they keep re-releasing new DVD copies of it. So somebody's buying them so i know i know the fans very well and i'm i'm very grateful to them they're kind of my some of my favorite fans because they've had to <laughs> be diehards against all odds we're swimming against the stream of a of a public opinion it's it's a bonkers movie and it's a bonkers movie it's it's so good to embrace the bonkers in the world I know. I, you know, I call them iconoclasts and I consider myself an iconoclast. So I like people who kind of buck the system and have their own idea of what's their favorite, including you, my friend. Thank oh. you. <laughs> um, I have an interesting question about some kind of wonderful, maybe it's been asked before, but um, given Eric Stoltz's dismissal from Back to the Future just a couple years prior to that. What was that experience working with him on Some Kind of Wonderful like? It was actually rather quick. I, I did a movie with him called The Wildlife. And then I did Back to the Future and he was um, let go after six weeks. And then only maybe a year later, not even, I was doing Some Kind of Wonderful with him. So it was an odd it was an odd journey with Eric Stoltz. And it's really funny. I just, uh, I, I love him. He's a great guy. And I had so much fun acting with him. He's so good. And he's a direct, most, a lot like me. He's a director now. And the, they just released a movie I made like 15 years ago for a friend of mine that never came out. But the weird, the funny thing about the movie is that it's shot completely in Eric Stoltz's old house <laughs> when he was doing some kind of wonderful I was like, this is Eric's house. What are we doing here shooting a movie? It was really a weird thing. And they just released the movie today. Um, it's called 10 Tricks. It's it's an odd little movie, um, but it's very strange. But um, 10 anyway, Tricks, let's go watch it. I imagine that a lot of people listening to this are a younger audience. So they might remember me more from, well, they'll, they, a lot of people have seen Back to the Future, but a lot of people have also seen uh, Switched at Birth, which is a series I did. Um, a lot of people really love that series, and I did that for five years. And that had a very strong deaf and hard of hearing cast, which was really exciting to learn how to sign language and to really, you know, explore a lot of really topical subjects in that show i'm very proud of that show we won a peabody award and a critics choice award for that oh very nice we also did an entirely silent episode oh wow nothing but sign language it, what, there was music but nobody spoke pretty cool eat your heart out joss whedon mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where do you get the idea <laughs> right <laughs> um i gotta say i knew you from caroline in the city Oh, I absolutely love that show. And I started rewatching episodes now. And yes, just thank you for portraying like this woman can, can have an awesome job and have her life together. It was very inspiring going back. Thank you. Thank you. I loved Caroline in the city. That was really doing a sitcom in front of an audience is like a very, it's very, I have so much respect for people who do it because it's, really really scary <laughs> yeah i bet <laughs> yeah comedy um is is really honestly the hardest thing to do and especially in front of an audience with no time to rehearse it's a it was it was an interesting four years of my life and uh it taught me so much you know which is why i love directing because i've learned so much throughout my 
long and varied career that I can use to, you know, to my advantage as a director. You know, after Caroline in the City, you started doing this uh, Jane Doe series of TV movies. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I counted and it was nine of them. Yeah. You were the title character in a nine movie series. That's more than Sean Connery did Bond. (laughs) Yes. Uh, That's more than Roger Moore did Bond, who did more Bond than Sean Connery. Yes, it was a it was a lot of movies, and I that's how I started directing. I directed two of those movies, and um, and they are it's kind of insane because they'll still have now on the they were on the Hallmark Channel, and now they'll have an entire day of Jane Doe mysteries that'll so start at seven in the morning and end at eleven at night. <laughs> They still have them and it's what, 10, 15 years. But yeah, they were fun to do. And learning how to direct a movie is a is a great way to start directing and directing myself. Boy, I directed myself in like two giant um, stunt sequences with helicopters. And I don't know how I did it. And when you think of Hallmark movies, that's what you think of is the helicopter stunt sequences. I know it's true. It's true. But that's what happened. And I'm here to tell you it really happened. Unfortunately, they don't look good on my reel because, you know, everything is now spread like this. TV changed from square to oh yeah, oblong. And anything that is square now just looks like a hundred years old. They've tried to take some of the pre-HD shows and upscale them and make them widescreen, Mm -hmm. um, famously with Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and they're terrible. Really? Why? Because the framing just doesn't work? Well, with Buffy the Vampire Slayer, it's shot on film, you know, and so rather than prop in to get the widescreen, they went back to the original full frame, and you have crew members in some shots. No! (gasps) Oh! And I was no. I was watching an episode of Angel and there's this shot looking down at like a sewer tunnel and there's just the most obvious C stand with a light on it just right in the foreground because they just opened up that frame and didn't pay attention. So those shows, I, I have fan upscaled DVD copies that are still in the 4-3 ratio and they're so much better to watch. Oh, that's so interesting. That's really, really interesting. I never even thought of that. And pro tip, if you like to watch TV on your iPad, Mm -hmm. that's a 4.3 screen. And Mm -hmm. those old shows are perfect in that format on your iPad. Oh, thank you. That's a pro tip. And I'm going to go with that. But that's a fun thing about shooting a lot of the shows that I've shot. Like I've directed Picard and and Star Girls shot in a wider format. Oh yeah, they're wider than wide. They're uh, mm-hmm. the what one seven nine to one. Do they broadcast it like that? I don't even know. Yeah, there's black bars top and bottom. Mm-hmm. And I did want to talk about Picard because I've also worked on that. I was working on it right before you came on, as I was mm. finishing up my time there. They were like, so Leah Thompson's coming on. Uh, Dave Blass, the production designer, was talking about how he had a, a Zoom meeting with you later that day or something. And I was like, ah, she's so awesome. But I noticed you've got like a lot of sitcom stuff on your directing CV. Uh, mm-hmm. So much Goldbergs and Schooled. And then you sort of start getting into more sci-fi stuff after Stargirl. Yeah, well, I'm really grateful to Jeff because I I wanted to get I wanted to I did a lot. Like I said, I'm I've been like learning. I wanted to learn different things as a director, and a natural start was comedy. And I was really grateful to Adam Goldberg to give me the Goldbergs, which was the first show I got to direct that I wasn't in. And until um, later, yes. Yes. Yeah. He gave me my first start at as that, you know, because everything else I had directed, I had been in. Oh, that's great. But you, and, you did end up playing a character on the Goldbergs, right? Yes. Okay. Just last season and um, or the season before that. I want to make sure and, I wasn't misremembering. It's been a while since I watched it. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed directing the Goldbergs. It's really fun. And I 
I'm going to go actually going there to direct a right around Christmas to, to Goldberg's. And I'm really excited about it um, just to see old friends. And it's just fun. It's fun. And I learned a lot about directing comedy there. I did a bunch of comedies and Jeff was the first one to give me a bigger budget um, kind of super special effects show. And I was super grateful to him for that because I really wanted to like, honestly, I wanted to direct the Howard the Duck Marvel movie. So I don't want them, if it ever happens, I don't want them to say, I don't know how to handle a big budget or I don't know how to handle VFX and special effects. And I think now I have a plenty of evidence that I can handle that. And uh, thanks to Jeff and, and getting my start in, in Stargirl. Um, I'm going to get the Stargirl fans to start uh, uh, <laughs> a, a fan campaign to make that happen. <laughs> They've tried. My Howard the Duck fans have tried to. I've actually, I actually did go pitch to to Marvel, but they have their long term plans for their characters. I don't, I don't know what they are, but it's it's just a little dream of mine to pay homage to Howard the Duck in a big way. It's probably a bad idea since Howard the Duck pretty much ruined my film career <laughs> to do it again. But I don't care. Actually, Seth Green, who is our Thunderbolt now is Howard the Duck in the MCU as well, I just realized. Oh, Seth Green is now Thunderbolt? Yeah, I don't know why, but for season three, Seth Green's the Thunderbolt. Oh, I didn't know that. Huh. Um, I'll learn something new every day. Um, yes, I know, he did the voice in in the Marvel... That, I mean, I'm sure he'd be amazing. But anyway, I really just wanted to, I keep wanting to grow and evolve and change and learn. And Stargirl's been just an amazing opportunity for me to learn all kinds of different directorial tricks in terms of fights and, you know, the sh like you mentioned, that shade scene that I'm so proud of with shade and Breck. I love that scene. I love the way we shot that scene. That was really fun to do. And of course, all the, the fights and the, I, I don't know. I've just had an opportunity to learn so much and I really appreciate it. Well, I have to say, um, I mean, obviously, you know that the tone inspiration for season one was Back to the Future. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Jeff rented a theater for us for a launch party and we all watched Back to the Future on the big screen, Aww. which was amazing for me because I had not seen it on the big screen since 1985. Hmm. And it really is such a different experience, too. But when you came in, you had your first meeting. After the meeting, Jeff was just smiling ear to ear. Like, he was so, oh. so happy to have you there and so excited about, about it. Um, because Back to the Future is his favorite movie. I don't know if you remember, but outside his office, I had photoshopped his face onto Marty on the Back to the Future poster. That was you that did that. That was me, yeah. Oh, I remember that. I was like, what? It's funny how that that happens a lot for me because Terry Metalis, who is the, was the show is was the showrunner of Picard. He has an amazing collection of Back to the Future stuff, including a DeLorean. And he helped to get the original DeLorean restored. And now it's, you know, in the whatever the Smithsonian. Wow. So he's, I, I get these jobs. They give me these big, <laughs> difficult jobs because I'm Lorraine McFly. <laughs> and um, yeah. speaking of Picard, Dave Blast, the production designer, um, is uh, my mentor. He's the guy that got me into the industry in the first place. I love him so much. He is literally the best person in the world. I honestly don't know a better person that exists. Don't you agree? He's like the yeah, best guy. I mean, he literally changed my life. So, yes. <laughs> He's a great man and a great artist. Him and Jeff Johns are the two people uh, that that are just the best two people that I've ever worked with. And if they could work together, I'd be on that project no matter what. Oh, my gosh. I would love to see the two of them work together. Dave is, Dave is I mean, he held all kinds of stuff together on Star Trek on Picard. He was just like the the rock 
you know, when everything was going crazy or people were freaking out. He was always there for everybody, even if it had nothing to do with his job. He's the kindest guy. I, you know, sometimes you think that talent doesn't come with kindness, but he is he's the poster child of talent and kindness. I love him. Yeah, he he literally dragged me into the industry like and then and then held my hand basically through learning how to do a job that I did not know existed in the film industry until I was hired to do it. Love that. So Love. he's he's just tops in my book for all time. We're the Dave Blast fan club. Love him so much. The John. Uh, yeah, I, I'm just rambling now. I can't stop. Anyway, he's great. And I really enjoyed every minute of working with him. He built some amazing sets for me. Oh yeah, the the set the production design on that show is killer as with everything he does. Um but also sort of straddling the line between comedy and sci-fi is one of my current favorite shows Resident Alien that you've done a couple episodes of as well. Yes, I love that show. Oh my god, the finale was so amazing. Go back and watch it if you haven't seen it, guys. That show is so fun. I had the best time and I think I'm going back to do some more of that and I'm very, very excited. What a great cast. What a funny, weird show. It's great. I mean, anything with Alan Tudyk is watchable. He's intimidating. His talent is so, so great, you know? He's so funny and so concentrated and uh, he's just amazing. The whole cast of that show is, is really fun. I had a lot of fun things I got to do on that show. Yeah, I think him and Linda Hamilton are the only ones that I was familiar with before the show. But like everybody on it is so just top of their game. Yeah, I know. I got to, uh, to direct a kid's play. My first kid's play. In one of my <laughs> and a death scene, a love death, a love scene, death scene with Nathan Fillion and Alan Tudyk and Nathan Fillion played a octopus. It was awesome. It was really so funny. I cried of laughter. I do remember I that. that was I can't good. eat octopus anymore. That's for sure. Oh, I stopped <laughs> eating octopus years ago because they're too smart. Mm hmm. Yeah, they they are delicious, but I can't I do it. No. <laughs> so I guess we should talk a little bit more about Stargirl. That's why we're here. Yes. yes, please. So I would love to know what was the process of you getting involved? Like as a director, do you reach out to shows to see if you can be on them or do they approach you? I think, I don't know. It's kind of a secret process that because uh, it involves my agents and everything. Mm -hmm. So I think I, I actually think this came through my manager who had been talking to Jeff before about stuff, um, you know, because Jeff does so much. And I think I think my manager was the one that hooked me up with Jeff and 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 he was so, so great. And I was so excited to do the show because it's just I love science fiction. Um, obviously, it, science fiction has been good to me, <laughs> but I've always loved some science fiction. When I was a little girl, I watched Star Trek, the original one, and it was it was changed my life. I just and I loved reading science fiction. I loved it was when I was a little girl growing up in Minnesota. So that's how I got involved. And, you know, it was it was pretty seamless. Sometimes, you know, you 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 work really hard to get at something and they just don't want you. But in this one, I guess, because Jeff was such a back to the future, he thought it was a good fit. And I got really good reviews from other things that I had directed, but he really took a big chance on me and I was grateful. I feel like Jeff probably didn't think it was such a big chance. Mm. I think he was just excited to have you from the start. Oh, that's so nice. Because my desk was right outside the conference room. I, mm -hmm. I, I got to be privy to things that I normally wouldn't be because it was also very near Jeff's office. So I, I would hear him talking about having you on the show and uh, he was excited about it. I don't think he had any, any doubts. On Stargirl, do you have a favorite, this episode 306, The Betrayal? There is so much, so many scenes. I mean, we have the big fight scene and then there's so much like introspective, like with Rick 
learning about his uh, hourglass and now he has full strength all the time. And then there's some comedy scenes. Do you have a preference of what kind of scenes you direct or do you have a favorite? No, I mean, what's fun is that there's so many different kinds of scenes to, to do in this kind of a show. There's the, the, the long dramatic scenes. There's the... Um, there's all the uh, there's all the scenes that are uh, big fight scenes. There's so many different. Uh, it's so fun because it's so varied. That's why I love this show so much. You never know what you're going to get, and that's that's really 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 exciting. So I can't really say that's anything's favorite. I mean, of course, I would have certain scenes that are you know like I'm I'm really excited to see the whole ice sculpture scene and I'm really excited you know because sometimes I do the stuff and then I don't get to see what they do after I'm done shooting so it's exciting oh, okay. the effects afterwards but what's really thrilling is to, to the dramatic scenes too and to see the actors playing together and being so great I mean you know to to watch Meg work, you know, she's so fun and so game and so sexy and awesome and fierce, you know, to see her and Stargirl fight or Yvette and her in a scene together with the stunt people. It's just really exciting. And Joel had so many wonderful scenes. Um, I also got to do some fun stuff with with Amy and and Luke. Luke is always funny in there. Um, so wonderful together. And I, you know, I just love the whole group and always the guest stars are so amazing. You know, everyone who comes in to be a guest star is, it's so fun to work with. I, I have, I have a great time with that. So there's always, it, it's always so different. And that's what I think we all love about Stargirl. When you first jumped into Stargirl, coming into your first superhero show, were there any particular challenges that you found in directing in this new genre? Well, directing is always hard. You never have enough time. You have to have like this really big imagination to try to just get get the shots you want and kind of nothing more. But Jeff is really... Jeff likes really wide shots, which is great. You know, they're they're harder to get, but he doesn't want everything all close up, which is really fun as a director because most most people, you know, especially in comedy, they want close ups and stuff like that. Well, Leah, I feel like we've taken up entirely too much of your time already. You are yeah. such a busy person traveling. All people don't understand that people that direct TV a lot are literally just jumping all over North America for two weeks at a time. You know, you could be in LA and then shooting something in Winnipeg the next day and then in Atlanta, you never know. Um, so I don't, I don't want to take any more of your time. Well, I'm actually, I've ha had such a great time talking to you guys and uh, it's fun because I'm acting right now. I'm acting. I uh, did a movie for lifetime called the disappearance of Carrie Farver and that's going to be on soon. And I also am now working on a series. I'm the star of a series called the Spencer Sisters. So I'm back acting. So it's going to help me. Then I'm going to go back to directing. So, yes, I'm super busy um, trying, putting on different hats all the time and trying to figure out how to deal with that. That's so exciting. <laughs> yeah, it is exciting. It's fun to act. The only other thing that I wanted to make sure that I said to you before I let you go is... On Back to the Future, obviously, you spent a fair amount of time aged up by 30 years. Mm -hmm. It has now been more than 30 years since you shot that. And you mm -hmm. look so much younger than your aged up self. And Thank congratulations. You. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, that's just genetics and not makeup. But thank you. I appreciate that. And thank you so much for all you do for Stargirl. I love I love the show. And thank you for helping get the word out to the fans. We love the fans of Stargirl. So do we. And I do the podcast because I also really, really love the show. And I love that we have you on every season. And <laughs> knock wood, next season will be no different. Yay! Because uh, knock on wood. at the time of recording, we still don't know if we have another season. Leah Thompson, you've been an absolute joy. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank and you. Uh, we hope that that we see you again. 
and we will be watching you uh, as an actress and a director. Thank you so much. Take care, guys. Nice to talk to you again. Have a good one. Bye. Cowgirl After Show. I must say, it was amazing getting to talk to Leah Thompson. It really was. It's been a while since anyone like left us a review and we're feeling unloved. So if you're listening to us on the Apple podcast app, just go tell us how, how great we are or how terrible we are. You know, I don't want to edit you. I don't want to influence your opinion. But if you're here this late in this episode, obviously you love us. That's why I wait until the end to tell you to go leave a review. So please, please leave a review and, and buy stuff from our merch shop. Yes, please do. You will not regret it. Sarah, your turn. Where's your stuff? What you got going on? Oh, same place. Uh, fandomlim.com. You can find the Swift Review where um, my co-host Ben and I talk about uh, the TV show Tom Swift, which hashtag save Tom Swift. Let's throw another hashtag out there. And then uh, we also have the podcast What's New Nancy Drew that covers the Nancy Drew TV show which we were going to have some fun game type episodes and recaps and all sorts of things um, coming out before season four comes out. Excellent. And I think, I think that's it. I think we've said all the things there are to say, except for we're going to see you next week for infinity incorporated part one. And until then have a super great day. Stargirl After Show is a production of Fandom Limb Media. Oh.